Hello there, and you're very welcome to Ireland Away From Home with myself, Jamie Moore. This podcast does exactly what it says on the tin, and it speaks to current or former Irish footballers or managers who have played and coached away from Ireland. In the last while, in lockdown one, we were in America with James Chambers, Owen Weirin and Jordan Doherty. We then moved to England in the championship with Dara Lennon of Blackburn Rovers, Zach Elbazetti in League One from Lincoln City and Pierre Sweeney of Exeter in League Two. And then we went to the Premier League to chat to Matt Doherty, who at the time was playing for Wolves and, of course, has since signed for Tottenham. The podcast is available in full in video format on YouTube and also in audio only formats on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever else you happen to find your podcast. I learned this week that a video podcast is actually called a vodcast. So I'm still learning from home as I go. And you can follow me on Twitter at Jamie Moore Sports. I'm also on Instagram at Jamie underscore underscore more one, where there'll be little clips across the interviews over the next six or eight weeks where we're going to chat to different people. And first up for episode four in lockdown 2.0 is Darren O'D. Darren, good afternoon or good morning. How are you? Very well, Jamie. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for having a chat. Darren has won two Scottish League titles, Scottish League Cup, Scottish Cup. He's played a couple of times with Celtic in the Champions League group stages. Also played in England, Canada, Ukraine and India. And I can't wait to find out about some of those more further foreign experiences. He's 33 now, manager of Celtic under 18s and of course has played 20 times for his country too. So Darren, let's jump straight in. You left Dublin, you left home farm as a teenager to join Celtic 16, 17 years ago now. And your career has taken you literally across the world. Lots of games for your country. You're now managing full time. How would you reflect on the last 16, 17 years in football since you left this country? Uh, unpredictable, probably is the word. Um, left home farm. We actually, funnily, with home farm, came over to Glasgow to play against Celtic. We had a, a kind of special team um, that I think nine of the starting 11 ended up signing professional contracts in the UK. Um, obviously, I went to Celtic. I was fortunate enough to, to break through, have a career at the club. And then probably when I went, my first move abroad to Toronto then just saw me kind of whetted the appetite, I suppose. And I ended up, uh, as you, you've gone through, uh, experienced a few different countries and cultures and found myself kind of back at the tail end of my career with Dundee. But that was with the focus of starting my coaching career. And I obviously retired at quite a young age because I was so keen to get into coaching. Um, and I've gone full circle with Celtic and back as now a, an academy manager. Yeah, I've loads of questions about each of the clubs and each of the countries that you were and stuff. But just in general, to start us off, your life in football and the types of places it's brought you to, the types of football matches that you've been able to play in, the life that you've been able to have for your wife and your kids, all from football and, you know, some of the amazing life experiences that you've had over the last 16, 17 years I'm sure if you'd write them down on paper, you'd have some really good content for a book, the places that you've been to. Yeah, it's funny. I've obviously have two children now. Uh, my youngest, Milana, wasn't with us in, in all the countries, but Lucia was. Uh, she's nine now. So like, she's lived in Toronto, uh, Ukraine. She visited India because of the circumstances. She, she didn't live there. Um, she, my family have got to see a hell of a lot. Um, and football has obviously afforded me them opportunities. Um, don't get me wrong, a lot of the experiences I didn't particularly enjoy at the time. Um, looking back and the person I am and the coach I am now, they've absolutely moulded me um, and they've been fantastic, but it sounds very glamorous, trust me. Uh, it's very difficult, especially when you're moving a young family around the world. Um, my wife is is very understanding. I don't know I don't know if she was doing that to me, would I be following her around? So um, brilliant, brilliant experiences that I would never, I would never trade for anything, but very difficult all the same as well. Yeah, you're born 87, yeah? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so that home farm team was a brilliant team, and my dad would have managed schoolboy teams against you guys, and I remember, well, just all those games at that time in, in the different parks in Dublin, your home farm, St. Kevin's, Cherry Orchard, Belvedere, who my dad was involved in, there were so many top players in that age group. And loads went away from lots of the clubs. You mentioned the number who went away from your home farm team. Could you have imagined then as a kid playing in those big games here in Dublin that your football career and your football life could have taken you where it took you? Yeah, yeah. That's why 
probably very similar to a lot of young kids at kind of 14, 15 and have started maybe going on trials abroad. That's what I did dream of and I probably naively thought I would 100% do it. I was obviously fortunate that my career allowed me to do it, but for the ones that, as you said, there was a number that went that went over from that, that age group. Um, some had really good careers and, and obviously some didn't and that's the kind of nature of football. You look at Cherry Orchard, Johnny Hayes was in Cherry Orchard, uh, Shell's manager Ian Morris, he was with kind of uh, St. Joseph's and Lourdes. Um, and then for my team, there was nine that went over, the ones that kind of had sustained careers, Chris McCann, Shane Suckle, who obviously left Ipswich at a younger age, um, myself, Owen Garvin, his dad was the manager. So um, that age group was was really, really strong. Um, and, and as you put, we, we had some really good times in the DDSL and, and Kennedy Cup uh, so really, really uh, enjoyable memories back in, in Dublin when I played football. But yeah, I absolutely did think it was all going to be possible. Probably thought more was going to be possible. Um, but that's, I suppose, what all young kids dream of. Yeah, you'd be happy to know Owen Garvin is still keeping fit. I met him at Holt Summit there last week. He was after cycling up the hill and he was trying to get himself a, a soft drink and a burger to get his breath back. But he was looking great and looking fit. I, I met him t- towards the end of the time at St. Pat's as well. A really good player. Um Let's go to Celtic first, Darren, and you move to the academy and then you move into the first team under Gordon Strachan. I think you make in around 50 first team appearances, a couple of leagues. You scored the winner in a cup final. Those couple of years when you won the league, you were in the Champions League group stages for both of those occasions. Some of the clubs that you've played against we'll mention in a moment. But as a Dublin boy, to go to Celtic, to break into the first team and to play at packed Celtic parks, playing games against Rangers... All of that type of stuff. How would you sum all that up in the, the early part of your senior career? Looking back, tr- truthfully, it was... It, people think when you make your debut, that's the start of the, the journey. It's not. It's not. There was an enormous amount of work that went in before that. Um, so when the moment kind of arrived and I was... Well, say, I, I think all Celtic players find... I think I made from I went from making my first team debut in a cup game to then making my league debut, Champions League debut, and then playing the last sixteen in the Champions League all within the space of a couple of months, um, or a few months anyway. Um, but that's the nature of the beast at Celtic. The games come thick and fast, and the size of the games are, are enormous. Um, but I was ready, and I, I adapted really well to the the atmosphere, if you like. But that came down to the the long yards and um, the hard yards, sorry, and, and the long hours I'd done with all the fantastic coaches that helped me get to that that moment. So I, I felt when I went into the environment, I'd been gearing up for it um, and I was ready ultimately, and you have to be ready at that level. It's sink or swim um, at Celtic because the, the size of the club, the amount of pressure that you have to deal with, some some just aren't made for it. Um, I was lucky my mentality was, was, but that, as I said, that, that came from the amount of of long, long hours I'd spent trying to prepare for them moments. So a lot of big moments came early in my career. Um, but as I said, I was ready. Yeah. How did you adapt as a teenager to life away from home? First of all, when you left your parents in Dublin and you moved to Glasgow to a big city to play for a big club and the stuff that we hear so much about young players and you know Irish players who move away and they're in digs and they're trying to make a career and maybe do some education and Try and deal with homesickness and all that sort of stuff. And it's ironic now that you're actually helping the Celtic under 18, some of them with that now, which is what you dealt with when you were their age. Yeah, I think probably the trend is similar for a lot of young kids when they move away from home. For a couple of months, it's brilliant. There's a buzz. You're, you're, you've moved away from home. I'm sure every 16 year old would want independence and. But it quickly wanes and you realise how difficult it is and training every day. And I, I listen, I, I understand and I'm certainly not, I don't get irritated when people say, but kind of football is a, it's a job that everyone would want. It, I agree with that, but trust me, it's very, very difficult. And especially when you're a young kid um, away from home. So probably after two or three months, I really struggled. I had a, a kind of a period where I struggled. I didn't struggle on the pitch. I was I was playing well. I was jumping up age groups. I was developing um, really well, but I struggled off the pitch, and then um, probably then had a, a six-month period where I was I hit a kind of a bit of a lull, um, 
and then eventually got my second wind and, and went again and then found myself getting into the first team off the back of that. So um, it's very, very difficult. Leaving home at that age is very difficult. I can't say I recommend it um, because for 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 the, every one that you get that comes through, there's there's dozens and dozens that that don't that don't quite make it and, and have to go home and, and nearly at a very young age feel rejected or or kind of a failure, which is is not the case because the reality is the majority that will happen. Um, so it's very very difficult um, leaving home. I, I just think it's it's not it's not right. You shouldn't be leaving home at that age, but. Football is football. Um, we do have players now, and I'm very aware of the the challenges they'll face. So hopefully, I can I can help them out through my own experiences. See, when you're playing for Celtic as a senior player in the games against Rangers, and just how big those matches are. But like living in the city, in and around those games, the build up, if you win or if you lose, the night of the game when the game is finished, the next morning, like what's that like? And and being in the middle of that bubble and, and maybe having to be careful maybe where you go at certain times because there might be Rangers people there or if you go in where Celtic people are, you're the hero. If you, if you happen to meet a Rangers fan after a few drinks, he's giving you a bit of, a bit of lip. How was all of that and, and living through that experience? That was the bit that took me longest to adapt to was when I, when I broke into the first team, I was obviously, I was recognisable before I was in the first team. That's how kind of, intense the the city is they know everything about everyone um but i was inst- instantly recognizable you get a lot of attention when you're either going into restaurants or shops at uh, many many uh uh scrape if you like both you're talking about out on nights out or out for dinner i had a day walking down the street with my my now wife we were going out at the time walking into a clothes shop at two in the day and you've grown men shouting abuse at you um now listen, Glasgow gets a rep for for being a little bit like this. I've loved my life here. Um, it's home to me now. There's brilliant, brilliant people, but the intensity of the the rivalry between two clubs you have to live with. Um, but I took a long time to adapt to that. One of my can't remember which uh, Rangers Celtic game, which number it was. I played in a number of them, but one of them we lost three nil at Ibrox, um, and I got left out of the team for three weeks off the back of it because I couldn't. I was inconsolable. I couldn't get my head around it because I understood the the fallout from it, um, and I, I couldn't get my head around it. And it actually, took me weeks to actually adapt. And and life goes on. And you at Celtic, as I, I said earlier on, the, the games come so fast. You don't have a chance to dwell on things where I probably would have earlier on in my career. Um, and then in, in in terms of going out, your life was dependent on the result of the weekend. So speaking to again my now wife or pals or whatever it was every night out or every meal you were going for was dependent on you wouldn't you wouldn't leave the house if you you drew and that was the thing another thing drawing a game was was a loss um and then ranger celtic games you would very rarely go out after them because you realized there was probably two sets of supporters out one was drowning their sorrows one was celebrating and um, I'd be lying if I said I'd never got myself in the middle of that at times. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I was young. I was impressionable. I liked going out, um, and I did. I probably made mistakes. I probably made mistakes. I definitely made mistakes. Um, but it took me a while to adapt to that. Definitely. And, and being from Ireland and being from kind of through the academy, it, it definitely sat with me a little bit longer than other players that were maybe coming in. It wasn't that they didn't care in the game as much. It was just the fallout or the build up where I always felt was more intense for. For players like myself. And what does that look like when you're a dub and you're a Celtic player and you've either won or lost the game against Rangers and or well in the case say you've won and you, and you want to go out for a couple of drinks with your missus or your mates or your teammates and you want to go for dinner. Like are there places that you, you can go to and there are the places that are definitely on the on the red list that we we just can't go there because we're going to meet Rangers fans or if it's a Rangers player I can't go there because I'm going to meet Celtic fans and that can't be a nice way to live your life because you are entitled to have the same life as anybody else, but because you played in a football match that day, that maybe has to be looked at. It's it, it was different. Like, kind of don't want to sound. Like, I was I was I'm a lad from Dublin. I was very down to earth. I didn't I didn't like the I never enjoyed the kind of attention you got. I liked I, I loved that. My favorite times in terms of social life was when I went back to Dublin. Um, and you were you were just, either no one knew who you were or no one cared, especially around my own area. When I walked in somewhere, 
I was recognisable, but because I grew up in the area, not because I was a footballer, no one, no one batted an eyelid really in Dublin. I always loved that. Um, where here it wasn't the case. Um, after Rangers sell the games, you'd never go out regardless of result. It was never a case of um, you just knew that was kind of a red zone. You didn't go out. Um, in terms of places to go, that was across the board. You would never go certain places um, ever. And I'm talking about both Celtic and Rangers kind of pubs, if you want to call them that. You wouldn't go and socialise in a Celtic pub because you'd probably you'd probably um, get your head pecked off anyway if you went and you wouldn't have a chance now. No fans would go. Oh, you want to socialise fans? You can't. You can't be a professional and have been out. Um, be seen to be out all the time and stuff like that. But I was young and I was I, see if speaking to younger lads now, I was the one that I didn't adjust my life. That's what I'm saying. I didn't adjust. I just went where I wanted to go. Um, I felt like I could do what I want when I wanted because I'm just a, a normal lad like you just said, like everyone else. The reality is you weren't. Um, and probably that got me into a couple of scrapes. Um, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have been there. But it maybe weren't my fault. But they were. I shouldn't have been placing myself there, but I absolutely had the mindset of, I'm just another another guy. Uh, I play football for a living, but um, I'll do what I want when I want. Um, but I suppose when you're 18, 19, you think like that. Uh, certainly, as I got older and had kids, you you start to realise the the responsibility on your shoulders is a lot greater. Um, so, yeah, no, it's it was. But listen, that's sounding like it was negative. It was great. I loved it. I loved it. I actually enjoyed the intensity. I still do I enjoy the intensity and living in it. Um, don't get me wrong, there's certain things that you don't, but the vast majority of it is a bit of banter at times, and, and both sets of supporters that I've come down the years um, have, have always been okay, um, so it's not been a massive issue. Speaking of that word, Darren, intensity, let's move to the Champions League, and two years in a row, Celtic playing the Champions League group stages, 2006-2007, games against Manchester United, I remember watching that game at 3-2 to United in the first game at Old Trafford, I watched it on the old ITV coverage, Benfica, FC Copenhagen and AC Milan. And then the next year, Shakhtar Donetsk, Spartak Moscow, Benfica again, AC Milan again and Barcelona. Like, talk about a football life and talk about two years in a row playing in intense football matches, not just at Celtic Park, but in some of those stadiums like the San Siro, the New Camp, Old Trafford. How do you look back on, on those games, having played through it and, and the challenge of them, the intensity of them, the enjoyment of them, obviously? I again, I thought at the time. Now I look back, of course, you 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 think of all them games fondly, and you you realise how how great it was to be playing at that level. I genuinely, and it, it's not the same. The arrogant thought that was the norm. I went to Celtic because I wanted to be a, a title winner. I wanted to be a Champions League player, and then when it happened, it wasn't. I wasn't kind of starstruck. Oh, I'm being. Old Trafford here, or I'm in the San Siro. It was just this. This is where I was meant to be going, and and now I'm here. And I know I certainly wasn't sitting at the time appreciating it, if you like. And, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way. That oh, I didn't appreciate. It. I understood what I was doing. I worked relentlessly hard to get to that level. But when I got there, I didn't think job done. I just thought this is going to be the norm. This is this is part of being a Celtic player, um, and it is part of being a Celtic player. That isn't unique times for Celtic. They're constantly playing in Europe, whether it be Champions League or now Europa League, and um, they're constantly fighting for, for league titles. They've won obviously nine now, but they've won, I think it's the last 11 domestic trophies. So winning titles, playing in big games is the norm. So when I arrived there, I had been through the academy. We had, I had fought for these moments to come. So when they came, as I said, I was ready. And I always felt in my career, the bigger the game, the better I was. Now, there was probably two reasons for that. One was the game maybe in the bigger games we were out of possession a little bit more and I was my own strengths as a defender was kind of positioning myself and um and reading the game. But also I felt I I was at ease when the it was a bigger occasion. I always I always found it much, much easier to adapt where um playing in a, a so called smaller game and that was that was going right back to my my younger days. I was always like that as a player. I enjoyed playing and in big occasions and as I said I think my maybe eighth or ninth game as a first team player was playing against AC Milan the last 16 in the Champions League you either have that or you don't in, in terms of mentality um, my, my, it doesn't it doesn't matter at that age and, and to play in that size of a game it's not about your individual ability it's about your, your mindset and I always felt that that was something I had going for me 
So as a centre back, and I know at times you played a full back across your Celtic career. I'm not too sure in all the Champions League games, but what type of attackers, strikers, wingers come to mind as as the best ones or the most challenging ones that you would have played against across those two campaigns? Well, obviously the first campaign was AC Milan in the in the last 16, and Kaká was I think he was he was maybe Ballon d'Or winner. He was certainly right up there among the best in the world at the time. But that AC Milan team, uh, I think it was it was Cafu, Nesta, Maldini, uh, Perlo, Kaka, Seedorf, um, Inzaghi. They they were packed. I'm sure it was either the year before, the year after. They actually won the Champions League. They were European champions, so they were top top side. Uh, Kaka was incredible at that time. Um, but in terms of fullback areas, I've played funnily enough the, the next campaign against AC Milan in the San Siro, but I left back and it was. Cafu and Seedorf for your two, the two guys up against you. I always actually enjoyed, funnily enough, my kind of strengths wouldn't have wouldn't have always been as a fullback. I wasn't lightning quick, but I enjoyed coming up against quick players, um, because I knew they would look to take me one v one, and that was always my thing. Was I lo- I loved having an opposite number that I could just set my mind to stopping them, um, so. Playing, playing across them games, I always liked players that were wanting to be confrontational with me and I always felt I tried to get the better of them that way. Where always the difficult ones were the ones that didn't come up against you and you had to go and find. And they were clever, if you like, where thinking down in the in the championship playing, I think my first game for Ipswich against Saha when he was at Crystal Palace early in his career, I actually enjoyed playing against someone like that as much as he was a nightmare to play against. I enjoyed that type of player, fullback rather than someone who, as I said, who would go and drift and you had to find, I loved confrontation as a player. It was something I enjoyed. I enjoyed trying to just stop someone and that was my job. Um, so certainly in them games, you had your your work cut out trying to stop that that type of type of player. Rooney and Ronaldo would have played in the Man United game, would they? The, uh, yeah, I, I think their kind of team at the time was, I'm talking the front players on the pitch would have been Ronaldo, Giggs, Rooney, Berbatov. I'm sure Tevez was maybe even there at that time. Carrick, Ferdinand, Vidic, they had a seriously strong team as well. So, um, yeah, obviously seriously good players. Were you involved in the Barcelona game the following year? I was involved. I never actually played. Um, but I remember I was on the bench for, for both of them in the last 16 and they were just surreal. Um, just couldn't get near them. Whatever they did and you match, they just do something different and you just couldn't get near them. And then obviously they had the genius and Messi playing for them at the time, although I'm sure in the second leg away from home, he came off with a torn hamstring early on. I think it's infamous he was in tears, which was, wasn't was disappointing at the time from our point of view, but you never want to see a player like that getting injured. Um, but yeah, they were they were top, top class. Um, but listen, all of the, seeing the Champions League, I remember playing against Villarreal, I'd never heard of uh, Carzola. Uh, went to, uh, he, was, he was probably one of the best I'd seen um, up close and then playing against them seriously talented and then when he moved to Arsenal and then you see his qualities obviously come back uh, to Spain now but the, everywhere he went the, the, it was the Champions League for a reason it was players you hadn't even come across and seriously talented So across your time at Celtic as well you had loans in England with Reading, Ipswich and Leeds anything jump out at you from those experiences and those clubs worth us mentioning in terms of like football or, or life away from it and stuff I know you did say it, a couple of interviews that you'd hoped to sign for Leeds on kind of a permanent deal at one stage and it never worked out that way yeah the championship the championship is a brilliant league um i love watching it um but i didn't particularly enjoy playing and it, it was just relentless there's so many games and the games are certainly when i was there were very similar everyone everyone played a similar style everyone was much of a muchness i remember one year i'm sure it was there i'm sure it was the year qpr won the league and they were topped by top by six points or something crazy. They lost 4-0 against whoever was bottom in the league. I can't remember who it was, but that was the league. You just, and any day you could get turned over and you could also be 2-0 up in a game. And I mean, on easy street and lose 3-2 in the last 10 minutes, you were just never, ever, you were never able to take your foot off the gas and it was relentless the amount of games. So I never, I can't, I love the experience. The clubs I played for were brilliant, like Leeds in particular, just an enormous club. Um, fantastic, similar to Celtic in terms of intensity. Um, Reading, Ipswich, top top clubs that I loved playing for. Leeds was a funny one. That when I say I was hoping to sign, I was offered a deal to sign at Leeds, 
um, and things, the kind of parameters changed uh, late on and it, it wasn't to be. Um, but but my override memory from the championship has been tired, <laughs> constantly going into games. I, usually in football, you're never going to a game 100%. You're always at about 90, 95 and you're always got a knock somewhere along the line or something. The championship, you're lucky if you're ever above 60%. You were just tired and um, it was relentless. But but again, played against brilliant players for brilliant clubs. Um, but I can't remember much of my time in the championship. I can't remember the games that much. Uh, yeah. They were all very, very similar, very physically demanding. Um, but as I said, brilliant clubs to play for. So in the next few years then, how did your life take you to Canada, back to Blackpool? then to the Ukraine, and then India? Well, I went away to... So the year I was at Leeds, I was uh, obviously playing uh, or trying to qualify for Euro 2012 Ireland. I was named... We, we did qualify, and then I was named Young International Player of the Year. Mind you, I was... I think I was 24 at the time, so I was the oldest Young International Player <laughs> of the Year you'll ever get. Um, <laughs> but anyway, sorry, the, the reason I'm saying I was in a good, a good place at the time. I was playing week in, week out. I was playing well. Um, was very much a big part of, of qualifying. I think I played half the qualifying games um, and then went away to Europe 2012, essentially out of contract, um, which I was quite pleased about in a way. I knew I was leaving Celtic at that time. I thought I was signing for Leeds, but then when that didn't happen, I was comfortable. I knew I'd have plenty of options, which I did. And a lot of them came from, from England in the championship. And I kept... When I say knocking things back, I just wasn't really interested. And I kind of went, I found it probably a period where I really wasn't motivated by much. And that was very unusual. Um, and it came from the fact I didn't really want to sign in the championship in England. Uh, but that was where my market was. I certainly wasn't going to sign. I think there was one or two slight interest from the Premier League, lower down teams as squad players. Nothing kind of came of that. But where was I meant to be going? My agent at the time, actually, we spoke about it after kind of a month or so. He said, where exactly are you wanting to go? Um, because I received really good offers. And the answer was, I didn't know. But I didn't, I, I just didn't know what I wanted. And then Toronto came up. I, I, funnily enough, something came up in Ukraine. That I, I came really close to signing. It never happened. Um, but I was, it was quite far along down the line. Um, and then Toronto came up. I remember golfing one day, a phone call came. Do you want to come? I said no. Um, and that was it. A couple of days later, came back up again. And eventually they convinced me to come out, fly out um, just for three days and see the place. So me and my wife went out, flew out. And I remember sitting, watching a game, saying, I fancy this. It was just different. It was different. The whole place was, the culture was different. The the people were different. The, the club was enormous, but it was brand new. The infrastructure they had was huge. Training ground. The finance they had, um, the ambition they had, everything was new and they hadn't ever qualified for in the playoffs over there. So I was thinking that's that's easily sustainable or sorry, achievable. Sorry. And then um, I can I can essentially win something with them. Uh, and I just fancied it and I obviously went for it. And then off the back of that, then my whole world just opened up. That was basically it. And I, I found myself kind of chasing that new experience every time I knew at that stage. I'm not going to play Premier League football and win Premier League titles. The only place I'm going to win titles is at Celtic, which I've done, um, or in, in lower leagues. So I kind of wanted something that was different all the time, and I certainly got that. Was there much in, in making the choice to leave kind of the UK, Scotland, England, that type of area, to go to somewhere like Toronto? And you spoke at the start about your wife travelled everywhere with you and your older daughter, I think, would have lived with you in Toronto. And that was the first time again. I'm not sure what age she was, but she'd been taken out of play school or taken out of primary school or whatever to, to go and basically move to a place on the other side of the world. Yeah, you know, it was huge. It was huge. Um, but yeah, it, it was huge. And But once I went to Toronto, I, I felt going there was the biggest move I ever made. So after that, it was... Uh, it kind of sounds a little bit romantic, but it's true. And we, we live by this now, myself and my wife, is once we had each other, we were all right. Once we were healthy, happy, we're fine. We, and also there's an understanding that your career is not going to be long. Your playing career is not going to be long. Now I'm actually, I kind of tell my wife, once I retire, we'll always have home. I'm now I'm back in the coaching career where it might take me away again. But I, I, the first move was definitely the biggest one to Toronto. Um, 
and we ended up going there and we still we've been on family holidays there with friends there that have, have spent uh, Christmases over here with us we made fantastic friends and it kind of opened up our eyes to the world uh, a little bit and Toronto was probably the happiest year of my playing career um, just in terms of the overall the overall thing the football was tough at times because we weren't oh, there was loads of stuff that went on the football side I love the football don't get me wrong but the my overall life I was just happy content my wife my kids uh, at the time was everyone was happy so that was the main thing and then after that it was just a case of we'll be fine we'll be fine um but the first move yeah there was a lot that went into that and we were very apprehensive leaving the UK from a, a career point of view was huge because I was an international player I was 25 it was a risky move um I spoke to a couple of people on it um so yeah, yeah, that would that the first one was definitely the, the most difficult. I'm not one to believe internet rumors, but I want to believe this one. Were you the highest paid player in the MLS when you moved there? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. The, the, no, no, definitely. Like uh, David Beckham was in the league when I was there. If I was getting paid more than David Beckham, okay, you know, okay, okay. In the league. Um, <laughs> no, so without going into it too much, because no, board of life, Eddie, there's salary caps there. So essentially, what it means is. You, you can hit a certain point and then over that point, the club pays you on top of that. So you take only a certain amount of allocation out of the club's budget and then anything above that, you're allowed to, I think at the time it was three players over and above that allocation bit. Now, whatever way, uh, sorry, and then the club uh, pay that because they, over there, like the, the MLS is who owns your rights, if that makes sense. So you can get traded amongst teams. That's for another day, to, to be honest with you, I don't really understand it still. Um, very complex. But anyway, my contract was designed in a way that I took more allocation money out of my club's budget than what David Beckham or Thierry Henry did as Red Bulls and Galaxy. Now, I was getting paid nowhere near the level they were getting paid, but the amount I actually took out of the club's budget was was more. Apparently, apparently, anyway. So my contract was designed very hastily. They were desperate to get me in. They did it in a way to, to get me in. I knew what was getting paid. I was happy with that. I didn't understand how it was designed, but it ended up, once I got to understand the, the contracts more over there, my contract, it was crazy. You sh I, I was taking up far too much of the, the club budget, if you like. Um, so that that's where that rumour kind of came from. Uh, so ended up that I went into a negotiation whether I re-signed a deal for long term, but to bring it down under the... the the budget, if you like, um, or leave, and I ended up leaving. If I were you, I would have spent all my money on ice cream. So I was in Vancouver in the summer of last year visiting my best mate. I'd never been in Canada before, and it was a place called the Marble Slab Creamery. I'm not sure if they have them in Toronto, but the nicest ice cream. I would fly there now just to have the ice cream. It was that nice. So well, Vancouver, Vancouver's, Toronto was an incredible city, but the that was one of the appeals of the MLS was I saw so many cities in Vancouver definitely was up there yeah so from there to the Ukraine to Metala Donetsk uh, again thinking of an Irish player playing for a Ukrainian team is I'd say you could be the only one ever possibly I don't know and I'm pretty that out sure there. yeah uh, how does that come up and eventually your time is is cut short you signed a two-year contract but because of the political situation it was cut short and in an interview at the time you said it was hostile intense but surreal yeah, so as I said, before I went to Toronto, the, I nearly went to Ukraine. Um, and once I went to Toronto, I, I, I constantly got um, approaches, if you like, from, from clubs. And Ukraine was seemed to be a country like I had. When I went out to Metalurg, I think I had four, four offers when I went out there. So once, once I'd agreed with Toronto I was going to leave, we were, say, negotiating. It was never going to be a negotiation. It was really amicable with Toronto, brilliant relationship with them. I understood my contract, so I was half negotiating, but half understood, right, I kind of have to leave. I could have sat on my contract as well, just to be clear. So but I knew I was kind of killing the budget, if you like. Um, so once that came up, loads of stuff came from Ukraine. I, I quite quickly, there was, sorry, there was uh, uh, offers from Russia as well. Um, and the one from Metalurk Donetsk kind of started to become the front runner and um we were negotiating the negotiation and it was so i was constantly having to get up and take phone calls at two three in the morning and um, it was it was it was a bit strange I, I i couldn't actually go out to see the place um 
<laughs> so I'm telling my wife we're moving from Toronto to Ukraine, but I don't know where we're going. I don't know anything about the city. So it was very difficult to get the deal done. Um, and eventually it did. I went out kind of with the pretense that the contract was ready to sign, but I wasn't definitely signing. But I knew in my head as long as everything was relatively okay, I will. So I ended up did sign and within, I think, I think it was five months, a kind of civil war kicked off. So I signed a three-year deal um, out of 100% stayed if I hadn't been for the, the troubles they had. Um, but obviously it got to a stage where, well, like Metal or Donetsk doesn't exist anymore. They had to shut down and I think they merged with another club. Donetsk was a war zone. So um, my decision to stay wasn't in my hands. I had to leave. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was obviously, I spent a year there where I, as I said, I would have, I definitely would have been staying a lot, a lot longer than that if, if I hadn't been for the problems. There's a life story. I had to leave my club in the Ukraine because of a civil war. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was sad. Like because the, Donetsk was, um, it was a really old city, but because of Euro, was it Euro 2012 was in Ukraine. I oh, sorry, well, yeah. I was, I was there. Um, so sorry, so Poland, sorry, I was there working. Yeah, Poland and Ukraine. Sorry, I was I was obviously based in Poland, but it was in Ukraine. So like, if you imagine Donetsk being absolutely nothing there, it was really really run down, and then a kind of maybe a two mile uh, perimeter with it's just a brand new city like plonked in the middle where all the roads were new, brand new shopping malls, brand new stadiums, hotels, restaurants. It was actually quite nice. But once you went outside that two mile perimeter, it was nothing. Um, so th- th- it was fine. To, it was fine to live in. Don't get me wrong. It was very difficult, be- but that was purely just because of my background and my culture. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really sad because like I I lived in the hotel that was the stadium that uh, Shakhtar Donetsk was their home stadium um, from 2012. Like when I say I was, I could have thrown a stone to hit it. Like a missile hit that. A, hit, a missile hit that shortly after I left. The next so it was just meant that you were in your hotel at night you were getting phone calls to say don't go out for dinner because they knew obviously the foreign players would go out for dinner regularly and um, don't go out for dinner there'd been a protest they'd always say it was a protest the next day you'd read the news and there'd been two or three dead in the protest um so and this would have been within a mile of where i was staying uh, so it was surreal it was really really surreal did you feel scared in danger safe like because you were in your your hotel or your area and you were just told listen if you don't go for dinner you'll be fine and then you leave and a missile hits the place yeah I, looking back now i probably should have left a lot sooner but the i know I, I did feel safe my, my biggest worry was the airspace closing so i constantly i don't know why like just looking back i oh, constantly carried my passport because if in case i heard that the airspace was going to close I, I could jump out like the, Thinking back why I was living like that, um, it was a bit mad. But the the training ground we trained in that got overtaken by the Russian army. But we like the training ground is like huge, like seriously uh, luxurious. You wouldn't believe it. Um, but we, I don't know if that was, that was the normal culture there. They had like when when you came through the front gates, there was maybe two or three. They looked, they were wearing our army kind of gear all, every day. That was just the norm. So you kind of always felt that that kind of bit was safe. As you, you were in your hotel, in your room, you felt relatively safe. But but obviously it, it was esky. Now looking back, it, it's obviously all these things happened at the time. I just, you, you were thinking it was a protest and someone was getting killed in a protest, which don't get me wrong, was horrific. But as long as I'm not there, I'm safe. But then it turned into an actual war, if you like, where there was missiles. As I said, the Russian army overtook our training ground. Boys lost their cars, everything. My, at all we every player had a uh, bedroom in the training ground so at all my gear and playstation everything so obviously that was gone and everything and then obviously you start hearing more and more as i left so um the whole club ended up moving an hour outside kiev so miles away from donetsk to a uh, urban i think it was called um so we the actual squad was living out of a hotel for and that's when i decided right i'm i'm leaving this is this is curtains here and to be fair i think six months afterwards the club ended up kind of as i said merging with another club so um strange times yeah god that's incredible and and from all of that then back to blackpool in championship at the time yeah championship at the time yeah so you're you have a three-year contract in ukraine it's cut short by two years 
you've come back to the UK and you need to play football. You need to be earning a wage again. So you jump into Blackpool. Tell me about that. And I suppose going from Toronto to Ukraine to back to England and, and back to the championship. Yeah, no. Yeah, there's more to it than that. I, I had a really bad injury okay. just as I was leaving Ukraine. So I actually agreed a kind of a termination of the contract. Um, so when I left, I had, I had a broken ankle. So I was, um, this is where you, you, without going off on a tangent, where you realise being a, a kind of a decent person and treating people with respect helps you out. Because I was without a club with a broken ankle, I was I was essentially screwed. <laughs> um, so I was w- really well looked after. Celtic uh, did everything for me. Alan Byrne with the FAI was fantastic. Between them, them guys, they rehabbed me. I flew over to Ireland for to see different specialists and to to get certain things done. Celtic were phenomenal. Um, funny enough, the, the head physio now that's in there, Tim Williamson, was. I'd have been lost without them. So I was without a club rehabbing at Celtic and then I needed a club to just play. And Blackpool were in absolute shambles at the time in the championship, pretty much relegated by Christmas. And I knew half fit I'd play and that's all I needed. I needed a vehicle to, to get fit again. Um, so I went there, played, I think, 20 times. I played every game from Christmas to the end of the season, fit, and then I was leaving. Um like the talk of extended my deal there was a non-start. I was never staying at Blackpool. Um, and sadly, they they kind of fell through the leagues a little bit and looked to have kind of got things together now. And, and they've obviously had a change in, in ownership and stuff like that. But anyway, Blackpool was a purely, I needed a game of football and they were that bad that I would walk into their team. Um, so that was, it was a, a marriage made in heaven, if you like. That's a nice story about the medical staff at Celtic and also with Ireland, that's, you were in need and they just helped you. And lots of times, you know, football clubs and football associations are, are, are seen as these massive companies and it's all about money and it's all about revenue and it's all about results. But to hear something like that is, is just a nice story. And for you, it was clearly a, a massive thing at the time when you came home with your broken ankle and you needed their help. Yeah, no, like I, I, when I went abroad, like I changed a lot through my, my I suppose, through maturity and, and experience I had. But that was a kind of, it was a big thing because, and it it kind of dawned on me, I always got on with everyone at clubs, always left clubs on really good terms, always shared really good relationships with people. But I did it because it it was just, you don't do it because you're hoping further down the line you can get something out of it. Um, But it did dawn on me then, massively hit me hard how how much treating people right um, is important. Um, So as I said, Peter Lawwell at Celtic, who's the busiest man on the planet, my agent at the time rang him to ask for some support and his first thing was, why are you ringing me? Get him to just ring me direct and of course we'll do anything. Tim Williamson, as I said, this guy is seriously busy but couldn't have done any more. And they treated me like one of their own and you kind of hear these cliched and fancy phrases of one of the family will always be part of the family. I, I was and I was treated just fantastically well by the club. And then Alan Byrne um, over in Ireland himself and a specialist over there, Steve Eustace, just brilliant guys now Alan Byrne was I always thought the world of him as a doctor but and, and, and as a guy I always uh, taught him fantastically well but you see the class of the man he was fantastic with me as well and this was by the way this wasn't for a couple of weeks and they did me a turn this was with Celtic I was in there for four months and um, Alan Byrne was still seeing me 18 months after the injury because I needed to maintain certain things and Steve Eustace as well and as I said they couldn't have been any more helpful now I I like to think that is because if you're a good person things come back to you but also I was around good people as well and I certainly needed help at the time so um no I was it was something that was very humbling I think so Mumbai City FC in India is next for you Darren and India is not a place I've been to I would like to visit it it's a country that I'm fascinated by and Nicholas Nelka was your manager at the time was he assigned for him yeah yeah so again it's it's another interesting move for an Irish footballer and, and you're back fit. You've used Blackpool as the vehicle. You spoke very directly there about the reasons why you went to Blackpool and stuff. So the phone rings and it's your agent or it's an agent working on behalf of Mumbai City or it's Nicholas Nelka himself. What's going through your head when you have to convince your missus and your family we're off again? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was on holiday. Again, similar to Black. In fact, do you know what? At Blackpool, I was in the hotel. They've got a hotel attached to the stadium literally about to sign my deal and a, a thing from India came through 
and it was something I actually wanted to do, but I was so far down the line with Blackpool that I thought I can't. It's talking about kind of treating people right, I thought I can't. I'd, I was literally there to sign. So that then just resurfaced in the in the summer when I was a free agent again, and obviously went to Mumbai. It was a it was a again a, the whole league was new. It was the second year I'm sure of the the Super League there. Um, and yeah, to be fair, India was different. It wasn't a case of we're moving there. It was I'm moving there because it was a 14 game season. Um, so we met. You're talking. I'm sure it was the first week in September we met, or uh, maybe late in September. Sorry, we met in Dubai. We had a three four week camp in Dubai. Then went out to India, and I was probably in India for I don't know two and a half months. Um, my wife and, and daughter came over, kind of in between for a few weeks. Uh, Everyone living out of a hotel, as in the whole squad, the whole staff. This hotel was ridiculously luxurious, incredible. Um, and then the city was just an eye opener again. I'm talking about the, the highest end of luxury we were living in, and you could look outside and it was the lowest end of poverty. Um, real surreal place to live in. Brilliant people as well, different culture again, something that helped me um, going forward. But a brilliant experience, brilliant, brilliant experience going to India. Um, but a mad one all the same. See, across all of that, and particularly in the Ukraine and India, how did you deal with the language barrier? Or was there one? Was was football in English in those places? Did managers, did you need a translator, even when you're out and about getting a coffee or in a restaurant? I'm sure you can you can learn the buzzwords that we all learn as tourists. But I know you're only there for short times as well, but there had to be a language barrier at, at some stage. Uh, yeah, so obviously Toronto is fine. Ukraine was obviously the biggest one, so I, I did my best to learn Russian and got to an actual decent level um, in terms of self-learning. It was just out of necessity. I'm a big believer in that. I want to, something I'm, I'm, I'm big on is trying to learn more languages, but I, I honestly believe you can learn it, but necessity is the biggest uh, learning tool. So uh, in Ukraine, we had a translator at all times with the team. Um, but I did my best to learn Russian and got to a stage where I could I suppose get by um and india no i didn't uh, it was never buried they all spoke brilliant english um and saying out and about i was you, you're talking out and about out and about in india i wasn't out and about very often okay um so the, and, and to be honest with you the indians uh, very well um the majority come across the uh, excellent english so um no, the only place that there was a pro was say a problem I had to really learn was Ukraine, and I actually really enjoyed doing that. Um, and Russian is not an easy language to learn. <laughs> so it comes full circle then, and and you come back to Scotland, and you sign for Dundee, and you spend the most time at any club apart from Celtic. You've been, you know, year here, year there for the previous years, and then you spend, I think it's three and a half years at Dundee. You're the captain towards the end, and you're starting to think then about jumping into coaching and stuff. But tell me a little bit about being back then in Scotland, having been in all those places and, and being settled at a club for the, the first time properly in a long time. Yeah, so I left India, I said it's 14 game season, finishes in December and I thought I'm going to go back to India. So to bridge the gap, I'll sign from January till May, play play with Dundee and then go back to India. And then I suppose when I was back in my normality, if you like, just coming home after training, collecting my little one from school, having days off with my family. I'd spent so long being away from them that the thought of leaving again was, I just couldn't do it. And and I loved the kind of four or five months I'd been with Dundee. Um, and then it was the decision, that was the conscious decision I made that I was going to not finish my career with Dundee necessarily, but certainly in Scotland and then look to, uh, uh, sorry, and then align coaching with it. That is when I started doing my, my B licence and I started to get the bug, if you if you want to call it that. Now, I had a mind that I wanted to play for as long as I can at that stage, um, but I certainly wanted to align it with with um, the next part of my career, and that was that was coaching. Um, so I came back, yeah, and, and as you say, I spent three and a half years there and had a fantastic time. And I think looking across my career, if you looked at it and you see one year there, one year there, I look like a guy who's jumping. If you actually look at it, Toronto there was always a circumstance to maybe move I loved I loved having a home and Dundee I found a home but all them other places I, I would have spent a lot longer if it wasn't for different circumstances um but uh yeah Dundee was definitely one that I, I did because I enjoyed the normality of it again I loved the club and then I aligned it with coaching so I, I coached from the minute I walked in the door 
Yeah, we'll finish on the Celtic under 18 job, Darren. I have one international question, then a couple of quick one word answers, and then we're there. Is that all right just for another five or six minutes? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I know you've got the kids and stuff going on, work as, as well, too. So, Ireland, 20 caps from 2009 to 2013. Giovanni Trapattoni is the manager for all of that time. I, I think I'm right in saying that. Yeah, in terms of me actually playing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, reflections on an international career, uh, you know, being involved in Euro 2012 in the squad, but, but not playing playing under someone like Trapattoni and, and all that went with that. We spoke about language barriers and I was sent the photo the other day of Manuela, his famous interpreter with him at a press conference. That, I first started working in radio properly then and interviewing him through her and trying to get a 20 second soundbite for a sports bulletin of Trap trying to speak English was an interesting one for all of us journalists. Uh, tell me about Trap Ireland and you for that three or four years. Oh, it, was, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. It was, it was the proudest moments in my career obviously young Irish lad playing for Celtic and you talk, talked about the, the size of games winning leagues uh, I think I played 70 games with Celtic but no can't compare to playing for Ireland um, so I just loved it I loved being part of the squad it was a really good squad it was obviously successful in terms of qualifying for year 2012 I came into it just towards the end of the, the infamous uh non-qualification of uh, the World Cup with Henri's handball so I was I kind of came into the squad around then I was obviously in Paris that night and then was in the squad for year 2012 and then for the for the following World Cup campaign and then obviously when Trapattoni left um, I dropped out um, but brilliant fantastic manager to play under um, for all the kind of talk of his style and different things this guy has worked at the top top end of the game pretty much his whole life and it showed. I loved playing for him, um, and I just loved playing for Ireland. How could you not? It's it for me. It was the pinnacle. It was the highest, highest level you could get to international football. So every cap was was just as good as the last one, um, and I, I just loved it. Uh, been away with the boys. It was brilliant. It's been you were around good, good guys, guys that were some of them were kind of heroes that I supported. Robbie Keane, Damien Duff, Kevin Kilban. Richard Dunn, Shea Given, all these guys, John O'Shea, I'd watch them, I'd support them and then to play with them and then the other guys then that were similar age to me, brilliant, brilliant guys. So um absolutely loved it. Um and everyone every every trip I had was was as good as the last. Trapattoni himself as the manager and I used a, a photo last night in the little promo video of him handing you a bib or you handing him a bib in, in Malahide at training and in those days, we got to watch a little bit more of training as journalists than we do now. The previous managers, Martin O'Neill and, and Mick McCarthy and Stephen Kenny, are in for like the first 10, 15 minutes or the last. You don't get to see much. But then, for whatever reason, we were able to just see... Now, we were never able to see the tactical stuff, but able to just see a little bit more of, of himself and Marco Tardelli at work. Like, I was just reading bits on Trap this morning and just his career and his experience and stuff. What was he like for you as, as a manager and particularly as a defender and you know, an Italian coach and a defender and, and I suppose the the association you would have with teams being organised and teams set pieces and defending well and that sort of stuff. Yeah, like, look, it, it, it's been so well documented, like, that we didn't, we kind of did the same training session over and over again and but there's been loads of talk of that. But at the end of the day, he had a really good players. We had some special players and then we had, a lot of workers, if you want to call them that, and call them water carriers. I was certainly in that that bracket, um, but we had a special group, if you like, in terms of the some of the best ever Irish players. In, um, and he he probably he probably didn't, without kind of sounding like he was criticising, he probably thought we were deficient in certain areas, so simplified the game. Um, we were very tough to play against. I'd imagine very very difficult to to break down. And obviously then, for not only me personally as a defender, but also the attributes I had, it fitted with with, with the style of play. And I spoke very early on um, in, in the chat that I've had with you that I, I enjoyed games where it was more about thought process rather than physical attributes. Um, and certainly with Trap Tony, you had loads of protection in terms of it was about dealing with the players in front of you, moving them, your full backs, wingers. There was a lot of work done in front of the back four, if that makes sense. So it was concentration and and I suppose clearing up any danger. So I, I really enjoyed playing for him. Um, he was a little bit mad, no doubt about it. Um, the actual tactical detail probably came from the fact that he just repeated the same thing over and over and over again. 
he showed the same clips over and over again. So you kind of didn't, he didn't need to speak all that much of a language because you did know eventually what he just wanted. Um, and then you were just with really good players. Don't get me wrong, if you put, if we had had a different set of players and playing from, I don't think he'd have been successful. But when you've got Aid McGeady on one side, Damien Duff, Robbie Keane, and then you've played players like Dunny and, and Shea Gibbon, John O'Shea, you'll do all right, no matter what kind of system you play. You, they're just good players. And then there was obviously other ones in there, as I said, that, that filled well and, and did their roles really well. Um, so I, I loved it. I loved it. Um, and as I said, uh, it was the it was the proudest moment playing for Ireland. You're watching or listening to the Ireland Away From Home podcast with myself, Jamie Moore. I'm chatting to ex-Ireland international Darren O'Dea, who played in Scotland, England, Canada, Ukraine and India. Darren, are you ready for our quick fire questions, sir? Go for it. So one word answers or short answers are good here, but you can be as expansive as you want. The best place you ever lived as a footballer and why? Toronto. Uh, my life was just brilliant there. One day I was... One day I was going to an NBA game, the next day to a concert, the next day eating in the best restaurants. There was a beach in the city that you could go walk in the beach. You just had everything you ever want. The worst place you lived in ever? Ukraine. Donetsk. Seriously tough. Uh, as I said, brand new city with a perimeter, but next to nothing to do. I was like, a, actually, my wife used to worry about me when she came and visited, or sorry, or left me for a while and came back because I would spend... I could go two weeks living in out of a hotel room and not seeing anyone other than to train. Well, the worst food you ever ate, what country was it in and what was it? Or the most interesting food you tried? Uh, everyone would probably think India, but India, I was living in the height of luxury where it was the biggest buffet and probably the best food I've ever eaten. Um, Ukraine, uh, every day, obviously, had to eat. Uh, we ate every meal in the training ground and... It was when I dawned on me that the chicken I'd been eating was actually rabbit. Um, I'd been eating chicken, I'm talking about for six weeks. I, I actually, it was really nice. When I found out it was rabbit, it put me off. The best player you ever played with? It's tough because I played with some top players. I, I would I would always go Aidan McGeady because the, I played with Aidan, both with Ireland and for a long time Celtic and true youth teams and, and reserve teams. He was just a special talent, even now in the academy. If you were to ever say who's the most talented player to come through the academy, Aiden's the first one everyone mentions. And who's the best you ever played against? Probably Kaka. Kaka. I, I named Kaka or Nicholas and Elke. Nicholas and Elke. Kaka for probably the height and the level he was at at the time playing against him and the, the magnitude of the game. Nicholas and Elke probably because he was the one player that I could actually say I couldn't get close to. He just took me to the cleaners one day. Your ultimate centre back partner, who you never got to play with. Oh, um, I would have loved to play with someone like Rio Ferdinand, someone really athletically strong, and then kind of good in the ball, and you could kind of supplement them a little bit. Um, probably Rio Ferdinand. Rio Ferdinand was someone I really, really enjoyed watching. Your best ever manager. That's difficult. Uh, I have I have to say Gordon Strachan because if you're going off best I've been lucky with Brendan Rogers played on Brendan Rogers Trapattoni, um, Martin O'Neill really good managers but Gordon was the one that I learned the most from as I said I, I spent the most time under him as well but he was he was very very good for me tough with me at times but uh, yeah Gordon Strachan. And if you came out of retirement tomorrow as a player, what manager would you most like to sign for? And you can't say Neil Lennon at Celtic. Because he's your oh, boss, kind of. Um, so you, you, you think I would say someone like you? I, I absolutely love Jurgen Klopp. Jurgen Klopp is, I love the brand. I, I wouldn't last five minutes playing that style. See how high they stand up the pitch. Um, oh, Jurgen Klopp. I would say Jurgen Klopp, but I'd be dropped within three minutes of playing for Liverpool. Um, but yeah, Jurgen Klopp is someone I just, I really, really enjoy the way his teams are set up. What's the biggest or best football match you've ever played in? The, the AC Milan games came early in my career. Um, about play home and away the last 16. Probably the, the away one. The San Siro, I think there was 80,000 there. As I say, I named the players that were playing. we were playing against. I just think it was a bit, it was a bit crazy. I, it dawned on me before the game how big it was. And then 
um, obviously came through the game, played really well as well. So, um, yeah, that, that game was, was enormous in my career as well. In the same answer, the best stadium and also the worst stadium that you've ever had the pleasure and dish pleasure, dish pleasure, this pleasure of playing in. Uh, the best stadium, I know I, I, I'm going to say because it, it genuinely is Celtic Park. See Celtic Park when it's rocking. It's, it's surreal. It's the best atmosphere I've I've experienced. And I've been, as I said, as much as I didn't play at, at uh, the New Camp or, or against Man United or whatever, the atmosphere at Celtic Park is the best I've, I've come across. So I have to say that. Um, and against, I've played in some bad ones. Play, um don't know. I don't know. Uh, oh, actually, just on to me, the club I play for, Blackpool. The, if you ever get the chance, 2014, I was there. Look at the pitch at Blackpool. Look I at remember. The pitch played them. Now the stadium was the stadium was lovely, but the pitch was it was it should have been illegal. The game shouldn't have been allowed playing it. Um, it was embarrassing. It was an absolute embarrassment. But that is the worst pitch you'll, you'll ever see. And I'm not actually talking about professional football in in life. That is the worst pitch you'll ever see. Um, so I have to. I can't. I can't think of a club off the top of my head. I've played in obviously some, some kind of rubbish dressing rooms and stuff. Blackpool was a nice stadium, but Jesus, that pitch was as bad as you'll see. Last one, and I think I know the answer to this because I've been out for a drink with you. But what do you miss most about Ireland and living in Ireland? Um, I'm, hinting at, I'm hinting at a point again, but it might be your ma's home cooking. It might be I don't know, just something nice in Dublin or or a crisp sandwich or a. No, um, I think uh, it, probably the accent, the accent. See, I always used to love landing in Ireland and um, getting off the plane. You'd be going through passports, uh, the security and all that. And you just hear the accent and you, you just realise you're home when you hear it. Um, I get that now a little bit with Scotland, though. I've been here so long that they on holiday or whatever. I get that here. But yeah, I always I, there was always a nice feel when I got home and you just hear that that accent very nice Darren let's finish on the present Celtic under 18 manager I was a viewer if that's the right word on a webinar you did with Sports Careers Agency early in the first lockdown and your job just seemed so interesting and engaging and exciting and difficult and you're 33 you mentioned earlier on that you you kind of wound down playing a little bit earlier to to jump into coaching Brendan Rodgers would have been the Celtic manager when you you became the 18th manager and now it's Neil Lennon and you've tried to deal with all of this through COVID, which I mentioned, and which we've mentioned for the first time an hour and two minutes in. So let's just finish on, on the present and the future for you as a gaffer. Yeah, well, I had, I'm kind of a big believer in planning things and setting goals for myself. And I, I won't go into my exact goals as a manager, but they're, they're high. They're similar to what I had as a player. Um, but I, I felt that the transition I going from playing to, to coaching was not natural in the slightest. I essentially thought I need to start at the very beginning. Um, and then I had a very clear way, or do have a very clear way in how I feel I will hit these goals. Um, and it, it all came down to working at the highest level of, as I possibly could without the real external pressures that first team football brings. So, my first opportunity came at Motherwell, who in Scotland, there's different tiers without going into it, different tiers for academies. They're an elite academy. Um, we're known for, I think last year, the most uh, minutes per academy player on, the, on in their first team. We're known for bringing through academy players. So I took a role there as, as an under-18 manager, kind of Motherwell used their resources or maximised their resources as much as possible. So I doubled up as a, a reserve team assistant and then was very much involved and kind of been around the first team a lot as well, which was great experience. Um, so my idea was always I wanted to work at the, the highest level as I possibly could at youth team level. So I actually set my first goal, which I can reveal, was to, to work at Celtic. Um, and the, the opportunity wasn't there at the time. I obviously assumed that it would take a lot longer, but it, the role came round three months after I took the Motherwell one, which was was difficult in all honesty because I absolutely loved Motherwell and the opportunity I was given there, I appreciated so much, but I couldn't turn down going back into Celtic as now the under-18 manager. So, um, yeah, it's about working at the, the top end of the game 
at the level I'm at and ultimately there's no higher level within youth team football I can go really because um, obviously you've got maybe clubs abroad or or down south um, but in, in reality Celtic it was the highest level so I aimed at that it happened a lot sooner and now it's about developing my own beliefs um, and, and principles that certainly fit within the Celtic Academy and, and club um, and I have a very clear way on how I think ultimately one day I want to be a first team manager but I, I I see that it takes a long time to build beliefs and principles that I'll live by and, and die by because we all know first team football is relentless and the, the scrutiny you're put under and the need for results instantly. Um, so I wanted to be I want to be ready for that. So ultimately that's what I'm doing now is is preparing um for the day it comes and, and when my neck's on the line I'll I'll be clear on what I want. Lastly, Darren, I finish every podcast with this question. And we've spoken for over an hour, but in a sentence or a collection of words, just finally sum up Ireland away from home for you. Um, Ireland is now, <laughs> this is a tough one, it, it maybe not when you hear. Ireland's no longer, I'm not away from Ireland anymore. Um, I'm now mm-hmm. I'm now home, Scotland's home. Um, I have a wife, two kids, lived here for, as you said, about 17 years. Um, Ireland is is always is always another home, um, but certainly early on in my career it was very very difficult living away. And um, probably the thing I miss most is the people, as much as Glasgow and Scotland, fantastic people as well. But Ireland is a special place, and people that that go from Scotland now, I'm proud to to kind of say that everyone that goes to Ireland always speaks about the people. And um, hopefully I represent that as well when I'm here. Um, but Ireland, been away from Ireland and away from home. Is no longer the case. I'm, I'm at home, which is, I suppose, my mom will be a little bit sad that I'm saying that, but that is the reality. But uh, a special place and, and one I'm, I'm very, very aware it's exactly where I've come from, um, but it's no longer home. Great stuff. Fascinating. Loved that. Darren O'Dea, thanks a million for joining me on the way from home, and we'll chat to you soon. Brilliant, Jamie. Thank you.